system that provided potable water that was integrated with the sewage system so that diversions of the sewers at key locations shows an attempt to maintain water pressure and flow to avoid clogging. It would have anticipated seasonal variation and long-term planning. One of the other reasons that scholars are interested in the sustainable past is that, and we'll go back to New York City, climate change. New York City, because it was built on a set of marshes that were filled in, is going to be inundated from both sides of it with water from two different river systems. I would like to say that we maybe could do some simulation and think about how would uh, excessive rainwater affect the kinds of uh, amenities at Mohenjo-daro. And I think we could also ask that in terms of uh, the end of it, of Mohenjo-daro. I have not seen in any of the reports a discussion of what kind of debris was on the surface before they began to do their work. I'd like to know what it was because it could help us answer some questions like this. But we don't have it, so we'll have to simulate it. Anyway, thank you very much. I invite uh, Professor Richard Meadow to present his paper. Thank you very much. I wish to begin my presentation by thanking the individuals who uh, thought of and developed and made happen uh, this particular meeting at Mahanjadaro, uh, members of the Culture, Tourism, and Antiquities Department of the Governor of Sindh, and the National Fund for Mahanjadaro. And I think that much of the reason that this uh, conference has been a success has been through the tireless efforts of people such as uh, Professor Lashari, who has gone out of his way to make, I think, uh, the life of we as guests uh, extremely uh, easy to bear. And I'm sure that, however, we have not been very easy on him. But uh, I think that uh, he deserves definitely the round of applause which you just gave him. I am going to uh, speak today about a subject which uh, Mark Knoyer has spoke about uh, at the beginning of the conference, and that is the situation as far as walls around Harappan sites. Uh, Professor Knoyer focused on uh, three sites, uh, Mahenjadaro, Harappa, and Dolabira. I'm also going to mention uh, two of those. Uh, I'm going to mention all three of those sites myself, spend a little time on Harappa and on Dolavira. Uh, but I'm also going to make uh, other emphases which he did not have time uh, to go into. This uh, particular image is the image of the small site of Rojdi uh, in uh, Gujarat. It is uh, a site which uh, existed during the period of the Indus civilization and went later. As you can see in the upper left, there is a what uh, the late Professor Gregory Fossell called a circumvallation. So there is evidence of what might be called a, uh, a, a wall and also a gateway, basically, that went around uh, this site. This is a quite a small site. You can see that the scale in the lower right is 50 meters, so it's really not very big. It's certainly not very big in comparison to Manjadaro. But I think this is important to remember that while Mark focused on the large sites, I think we also have to pay attention to the small sites as well. Also drawn from Gregory Fossell, and just as, some, as a heuristic device to make us think a little bit about variability across the Indus area, uh, this is the, d these are the domains which uh, Professor Fossell uh, published in 1998. 
I think many of us would have some issues perhaps with uh, the outlines of these ones and the fact that they looks like they have uh, fairly uh, uh, sharp boundaries, but in fact, uh, as Professor Fossell constantly emphasized, these boundaries were never sharp. Uh, and this is just a heuristic device to uh, emphasize the fact that you have different areas of the Indus world and in these different areas, you had varying uh, types of material culture. And also varying uh, approaches to settlement and to urban structures. Now, the Indus civilization can be conceptualized as a cultural phenomenon of about five to 700 years in duration, depending upon where you are varying in expression across time and space. It dates, uh, as I say, from about 2600 to 1900 BC. And much of what we know from, if not most of what we know, comes from the later parts of the uh, period of the Indus civilization. And we really have little, uh, not so much understanding of the earlier parts. That's one reason why the work of uh, the French mission at uh, Chanodaro is so important, is because, because they are focusing on the earlier levels. And at Harappa also, in the last couple of seasons of our excavation there at the uh, end of uh, in the year 1999, 2000, 2001, we also were focusing on that earlier period. Also, another thing which I think uh, uh, an interesting way to conceptualize the uh, Harappan phenomenon is that what you actually see at Harappan sites uh, is a veneer of Harappan material culture of varying thicknesses that developed out of or came to overlie local cultural substrates. And this, I think, is very important to understand, and that was the purpose also of putting up the domain uh, image is that in these different areas there are substrates, there are populations which existed in those areas before people who utilized uh, Harappan artifacts uh, either moved into the area or the local people themselves decided that they would buy into this new system of uh, ideology and, uh, and practice. The these are some aspects of the Harappan veneer. And as you know, a veneer is if you look at a tabletop these days, which are made commercially, that have a nice surface over it, but that surface actually is very thin, and it will be glued down to some plywood or other material, less good material underneath. So what you're seeing on top is just this veneer. And this is what you're seeing in many cases uh, in Harappan, so-called Harappan sites, is that you have a veneer of things like the very uh, typical type of pottery, which you see in the upper left. You have the seals and the tablets. You have uh, uh, vessels which are found over the whole Harappan area and beyond, I mean, into, uh, uh, into the uh, Sultanate of Oman and, and in Arabia, the uh, black slip jars. You have the uh, weights down in the lower right. And also you have a certain type of uh, city planning which varied, of course, between uh, different sites, but which oriented more or less to the cardinal points and uh, was uh, uh, built of uh, different sorts of materials. And this is also important to emphasize is that different materials were used more commonly at different sites. And so the three sites which I will mention, um, large sites which I'll mention today, which Mark also mentioned, Harappa, uh, Dolavira, and Mahanjadaro basically had actually quite different uses of materials to actually construct uh, their uh, conception of what a, uh, this sort of large uh, city should uh, be. And the other thing which is really important to emphasize is that the Indus civilization was constantly being impacted by both internal and external forces, both cultural and non-cultural. The, as I think the work of Randy Law particularly has shown very uh, st uh, st starkly, uh, the Harappans sustained themselves from a large surrounding uh, so-called sustaining area 
and in order to move materials across these areas, whether they be uh, uh, precious stones or just material to make grinding stones or what have you, they had to have uh, relationships with the peoples in the areas from which they were getting the materials. In addition, we know very well from the maritime history of, uh, of uh, the region that you have uh, movement of uh, Harappan traders uh, from Gujarat and um, uh, the uh, Indus Delta and uh, uh, Makran uh, west uh, into uh, the, per to the uh, Persia Arabian Gulf and also probably uh, similar movements overland both north and south. Uh, these individuals were uh, by no means isolated uh, from uh, the world at large at that particular time. So turning now to briefly to Harappa, uh, what you see here is a, uh, three different plans of the western portion of the site. The one on the left being that which was published by Vats in 1940 and reflects the work up to that period of time. Uh, the middle one is the one that was published by uh, Sir Mortimer Wheeler based on his uh, rather quick excavations, but very thorough where he did excavate uh, in uh, uh, basically in the late, in the mid 1940s. And the one on the right is the plan which we use at Harappa today in order to uh, designate the different areas in which uh, we have uh, been carrying out work in collaboration with the uh, Department of Archaeology and Museums of the Government of Pakistan and now with the Department of, uh, of, um, of Archaeology of uh, Punjab uh, province. I think one thing which hasn't been uh, really touched on very much in, in dealing this, uh, with this issue of uh, uh, walls is that there, there's a terminology, uh, there's questions of terminology and questions of function. As you know, words have overtones, they have meanings, and they have very common uses. Some of them are more loaded than others. So for example, a particularly loaded term is fortification wall. This implies that there it was built for the purpose of protection against uh, raiders or against uh, warfare, people coming from outside and trying to take over the city. A similar sort of thing is defense wall, is a very, also a similarly loaded term. However, there are less loaded terms, such as perimeter wall, which is the term which I've used, uh, circumvallation, which is a term which uh, Greg Possell used, uh, and then there are other aspects of walls, and that is, re relates somewhat to their function, and that is a retaining wall uh, or a bund, for example. And those get us into the functional aspects, not only, of course, fortification and perimeter. Uh, fortification and defense also are functions. Uh, perimeter and circumvallation are uh, more neutral terms. As far as functions are concerned, you have the protection against whatever, whether it be uh, raiders or uh, uh, other uh, sorts of or wild animals or anything like that. Delim uh, also a function of delimitation and control. Uh, Mark Knorr has made some strong uh, points about this uh, as far as the way that uh, walls and the gateways can control the flow of population and uh, can uh, be uh, places where you can actually tax individuals who come in or out of the city and control what is going on in the different parts of the city. You also have um, uh, very multifunctional uh, functions, uh, which uh, I think you can see by just putting together what I've talked about before. The walls can have many, many different functions. And that's something I want to emphasize And when we come to looking at some of the sections of the walls themselves. And in addition, you have to look at the situation of that a wall may have been built for one particular purpose, but the purpose of that wall may change through time <coughs> and you may, uh, it actually may have a different uh, purpose. So you have the original tent versus the eventual effect of creating uh, that uh, structure. And when I'm speaking about walls here, I'm talking about uh, perimeter walls. So uh, not, not, of course, the same can be held true for uh, domestic walls because domestic walls can later on provide as foundations for later structures on top or can be filled in and make platforms and what have you. So there's all sorts of multiple 
things which happen over the life. So you can think about the birth and then the life and then the death of any of these sorts of things. Now, Peter Eltsoff, in his 2008 book, basically based on archaeological data and the ancient Sanskrit and Pali texts, uh, argues that perimeter walls were part of the defining essence of a settlement in both the Indus and Gangetic civilizations, and that such walls often may have had an ideological and not a functional foundation. So this is another possibility, is that people built walls because they identified with living in, in uh, settlements which had walls, and that was just the way they did things. I find that possible, but I think there are a lot more functional reasons for doing this, which eventually may have developed into something which just became a way of life and people just thought about it. That's the way we do things. So just here are a few sites which have perimeter walls or which we don't know whether they have perimeter walls or not. So Sutkagandor, which was uh, looked at very early by Stein and then by uh, George Dales, is a very clear case of a site which seems to have had an intentional uh, perimeter wall. And I was speaking with uh, Aurore Didier uh, yesterday about this, and she firmly believes actually it was built for defensive purposes because of the nature of the site, its isolation in that area. And, uh, at, at, and as a result, she feels that, that is, uh, there's a good case can be made for that purpose. She's visited the site a number of times. And the fact that the wall actually, I believe, is um, still stands quite high above the surrounding settlement means that it was uh, it did not it was not built up behind it as in other settlements, for example. Then at Harappa, of course, uh, we'll get into that later. Uh, you have Harappa. Uh, previous to 1946, the walls weren't really very the, the perimeter walls weren't really very well isolated. Uh, after that, with uh, Wheeler's work, uh, particularly in the AB mound. He isolated uh, the huge perimeter wall around Mount AB, and then uh, the, Harap, uh, the Harp project subsequently uh, basically has done the same sort of things in Mount F and uh, also uh, in um, uh, Mount uh, E and ET. Kalibangan and Banawali are just two examples, just two of a number of examples uh, to the north and east basically, which have very well-defined uh, perimeter walls. Rocky Gary, I believe also, and Shinde can correct me if I'm wrong, also has perimeter walls. Uh, Sutka, uh, Sutkako, Dolavira, and Lotol down in uh, Kutch all have, uh, have um, perimeter walls, as do more recently excavated sites, uh, such as um, uh, Bagasara and uh, Shikarpur, for example. The site of Noshiro also has uh, a city wall or a uh, circumvallation or perimeter wall. And uh, we now know, uh, as has been spoken about earlier in uh, this uh, session and in this conference, Mahanjadaro almost certainly had, we know had, uh, had circum uh, perimeter walls in some places, but uh, one point I want to make here is that uh, this is one thing which really needs to be focused on and which is actually will be able to be partially solved through the coring, the dry coring, and that is to see where the perimeter, other parts of the site, whether they had perimeter walls around them, which I think they likely did, especially the higher areas, and to try to define these. And I think um, it's useful to make the point that, as I did in my abstract, is that once you can identify the locations of these perimeter walls, they could actually be rebuilt in a sense and serve as protective area, protection for uh, the existing uh, uh, remains. Because uh, as we'll see in a minute, I'll tell you why, that would, why that's important. Then we have questions at sites such as Cote DG, Balakot, Aladino, and Shortagai. We don't really know, I don't know, but I may be mistaken, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know uh, whether these sites have uh, perimeter walls or not. And so if you don't go looking for them, uh, oftentimes you're not going to find them. And I'll get back to that in a moment. Around the different uh, portions of the site, this uh, reflects the fact that the, uh, the, 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 reflects the uh, situ situation that you have uh, these different high mound areas. And here you have uh, 
a much less good uh, image than the one Mark showed the other day, uh, showing uh, Wheeler's uh, section. And you can see clearly that you have the, uh, in, on the right hand side is the uh, interior of the mound and the left side is the exterior of the mound. And you can see clearly that over time you had, uh, had basically uh, debris deposits and settlement deposits basically backing up on uh, the city wall, which was extended through time as it got higher and higher, got extended more and more to the left uh, as uh, the city grew up uh, behind the wall. And uh, another image of that uh, can be seen in uh, the excavations of Harp, basically, in that uh, region, where in the lower portion you have the period two original wall, and then up above that you have the different uh, rebuildings of the wall as it goes up the mound and basically going off again to the left as the mound is, is basically growing uh, to the left as well as the further up you go. And this basically also shows you an important uh, function of these walls and that is that they actually um, acted as retaining walls. They basically allowed people to keep building on top of the, uh, their, their ancestors' remains. And why might you want to do, build on top of your ancestors' remains? Well, there may be ideological reasons, but also if you think about these areas, and this was emphasized by, um, by the, uh, Professor Solani and uh, Dr. Janssen uh, uh, and uh, Joe Schoenrein, is that you're living in an alluvial plain in, in these areas, and you have floods. And one way you can protect your, uh, your houses and your animals against floods is to, have, is to raise the area that you're living in above those floods. And remember that as these areas silted up over time, the ground level started going up as well. And so the floods would actually be higher and higher and higher as well. And therefore, you need to build your site up higher and higher. So one of the main purposes of these walls in this sort of situation, these alluvial situations, probably was, in fact, to act as retaining walls for ever higher settlements. Sorry. OK. Um, here we have, again, the map of Harappa. And you can see that the walls which the uh, Harappa Archaeological Research uh, Project uh, managed to define on Mound E and Mound ET to the east only portions of the walls were exposed, but we are uh, really quite confident that uh, these uh, city walls actually, uh, or perimeter walls, actually surrounded each of these high mounds, thus allowing the mounds uh, to uh, basically grow up uh, within those walls. And also, uh, another feature which I will focus on right now is up in the area which you see number uh, 41 up above, that is the uh, so-called uh, large hall or granary area. And you'll see that up in the upper portion there is a diagonal black line. And that diagonal black line basically is the actually the excavated area that we excavated a cross section through of uh, the city wall of, uh, of the perimeter wall of Mount F. And this perimeter wall of Mount F was actually buried underneath the back dirt of the, of the original excavators. And that's why it was never actually identified. And uh, if you'll note that the, um, the uh, bottom of the wall is at about 159 meters. The bottom of uh, Wheeler's trench wall is at about 162 meters. This is probably at least three meters lower uh, than the bottom of the city wall on the, on the east side. Uh, uh, west side of uh, Mount AB. So we're looking also in an area here where you have differing degrees of um, altitude uh, uh, in uh, different segment, uh, original altitude in different parts of the site. And one reason, of course, for building a uh, wall here, especially when they started uh, settling in this area, is again to act as protection against the inevitable floods which would be coming down upon them. And uh, over time, of course, the, uh, the structures inside uh, the, uh, the area of the uh, granary uh, also grew up uh, through time and the walls, but the walls continued uh, to grow as well. 
Now, one reason why it's sometimes hard to ident identify uh, perimeter walls at Harappan sites is because their core is made of kacha int, of uh, mud brick. They may have been faced with baked brick, but at Harappa, we know that the British did a good job of taking away the baked brick. And uh, as a result, the baked brick would help to uh, stabilize uh, the mud brick walls. Once you take the break brick away, then the, uh, the, uh, the mud brick uh, uh, perimeter walls will erode much quicker, actually, than the remains which are existing in the center of the city itself, because those remains have a lot of pottery and other durable materials in them, which will help to protect the erosion on the high mounds, but will cause erosion of the, uh, of the interior portion of the city wall. So this is what happened uh, in basically on, on the uh, east side of Mound E. And so it was only by scraping the surface that we actually came down on the top of a city wall, which we know uh, from the excavations originally st uh, stood much, much higher, but was eroded away. And here is the gateway of, uh, and the drainage, a later drainage uh, channel of uh, looking uh, south uh, in between Mound E and Mound uh, ET. And you can see the, uh, the opposite direction view of the reconstruction, again, by uh, Mark Knoyer of this area. And you'll notice that you have the, the perimeter wall on the left, but uh, as far as we know, uh, the, uh, the uh, air Mound ET on the right did not have a perimeter wall parallel to the one uh, uh, on the left side. And so basically, the what you had was a gateway, and then the perimeter wall continued around to the, uh, to the right, to the, uh, to the east, and went around the rest of the site. But there was not a separate perimeter wall for the, on the western side of that particular area. But I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong. And here you can see, which is a very important aspect, is that, of course, settlements at any of these sites change through time. And here you can see the, uh, the, the uh, the pink area, basically, of Mount E and Mount uh, AB reflect the areas of the uh, uh, first settlements uh, in the Harappan period at this site. Uh, and then you have uh, the period two material in purple. And then you have period three, which reflects the, uh, the greatest extension of uh, settlement at Harappa itself. This is the period between uh, 2100 and 1900 BC or 2200 and 1900 BC, which is this period when we perhaps had a significant climatic <laughs> events happening in the region. So it's interesting here that the site of Harappa actually reached its greatest extent during this period of potential crisis. Now quickly, very quickly moving uh, to uh, Dolavira, which is located uh, on uh, Kadir Beit in the uh, Great Ron of Kutch. You have here uh, the a uh, reconstruction of what the city looked like. We all know that the city was, uh, as Vish just described it, was a really a water harvesting device uh, with very significant uh, settlement population as well. And this is a uh, plan of the settlement and you can see around the outside you have the exterior perimeter walls, then you, in, the, in the middle you have the uh, middle town perimeter walls, and then on the lower side on the, on the, on the bottom you have the Bailey and the, uh, and the, uh, and the area uh, next to it, uh, which also uh, were walled as well. Uh, and those are the highest portions of the site, the ones in the south. And again, they grew to a uh, great height, as you can see in the lower picture, which you can see is actually very similar in its configuration to the one at Harappa. This is through the drainage channel or the cut, which was made uh, by erosion through uh, the Dolavira. And you can see that the two uh, types of the wall and what have you are quite similar in uh, overall view. Of course, the details are different. And in contrast, these are the, uh, this is the walls on the outside of the outer, port outer walls of the site. And these uh, were never faced as the uh, uh, ones on the, uh, uh, on the inner, uh, inner areas were. These were never faced with uh, stone. They seem to have been purely mud brick uh, structures. Of course, just I always love showing these pictures of Dolavira because it's such fabulous preservation. 
uh, of these and the fabulous stonework which took place at the site. And here again, it's important to emphasize that these different sites had used different materials as their primary uh, materials. All used mud brick, but